Good afternoon. My name is Eli Howes. Can you please tell me your full name? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mohammed Ahmed Jallo. And what should I call you? Yeah, you can call me Ahmed. So Ahmed, in this first part, I'm going to ask you some general questions about yourself. Let's consider, first of all, what you do. Do you work or are you a student? Well, at the moment, I'll say a bit of both. Um, I'm studying and at the same time, I'm working, but uh, not, at, not full time. I'm, doing, I'm finishing my studies currently, which is uh, largely focused on a part of the research right now, which is like, you know, like I said, it's not full time. So on the other hand, I'm also working at the laboratory as a graduate research assistant at Eichmann Institute for Molecular Biology, where I do, uh, I analyze samples, clinical samples from sick patients, sometimes from study groups or other times from hospitals. Do you prefer to study in the morning or in the afternoon? Well, I think it depends on what I'm studying. Uh, if I want to retain what I'm really studying, like uh, I want to keep it in memory, uh, I usually study in the morning because uh, in the morning, I'm, I'm kind of person who have developed this morning routine where I, in the morning, my mind is clear after some form of meditation because I have this meditation routine. So it helps clear my mind and helps me focus. So at that time, I'm at optical, you know, like optical focus is like laser focus. So if I want to retain something, I study it in the morning. But if I just want to go over something just like, you know, a revision, yes, I'd rather do it in the evening because most of the time in the evening, it's not good for memorization because your mind, you are exhausted from, uh, you know, doing a lot of things throughout the day. Let's move on. Let's talk about um, talents. Do you have a talent or something that you're especially good at? I don't know if I should call it a talent, or, but I'm really good at uh, connecting with people and through conversations and communication. And, um, and yes, that's it. When it comes to personal connection or interpersonal connections, uh, I'm really good at that. And when it comes to sporting activities, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of talented football player as well. Uh, I know uh, in the UK, we call it football, but in America, they call it soccer. So uh, I do that as well. And like I said, I'm, I'm a very good person when it comes to social activities. Do you think your social talent can be useful for your future work? Absolutely. Um, some of my work involves uh, dealing with people outside of the laboratory, most especially when we go in the field to collect samples. We have to see the social, the social context of how these people live and how to approach them. So if you are an approachable person or a, a person who is very easy to get close to, it's, it's very, very important because sometimes your appearance also have a role to play how you appear to the people sometimes, how you dress, these are all factors that play in approaching people. So, and sometimes my work outside the laboratory has to do with dealing with people, underprivileged people, people from low socioeconomic background. So I think I've already grasped that uh, technique, that way of dealing with people. So I think my social approachability is very vital to my work. Do you think other people in your family have the same talent? Probably not all of them. I'll say my younger brother, yes, uh, he have similar, or more or less, maybe, uh, maybe probably more than me. And he has a lot of friends, most especially in the social arena. Uh, he have a lot of friends more than me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I think he has the same thing. But our elder brother is kind of shy person, somewhat loner and. But he's, he's okay, but, you know, it's not very socially involved. Thank you. Let's yeah. move on. Let's talk about art. Do you like art? Uh, oh, no. I, I'm a big fan of art. Um, but the kind of art I like, uh, I know it's, it's kind of strange to a lot of people because I love abstract art, you know, uh, the kind of painting where people just take the flashes and then you just sprinkle it on the board and and... Yeah, I really, really love art because, and what makes me love art that much is that it's not decipherable by everyone. Not everyone can decipher art. It's mostly deciphered by the artist, artist himself, you know, and herself. And 
the, risk, the thing about art is that every artist or every art that is drawn or that is produced has its own unique story. There's a story behind every art. And sometimes I go to art museums and I ask the, I try to find the artist to ask them, what is the story behind this? What is the inspiration behind this? And the way in which they explain it to me makes me love it so much. So I'm a very big fan of art. And <laughs> although I don't have some displayed here right now, but yeah, I, I really, really love art. Abstract art to be exact. And did you learn drawing when you were a child? Uh, maybe not necessarily drawing abstract stuff, but when I was in primary or elementary school, uh, a lot of our biology work involved drawing the species that we study, like chickens or the digestive system or like, you know, whatever animal we are studying at the time or an organ within the human body, we were instructed to draw it because it helps, it helps us remember it and retain that image within our mind and the past and our various functions. So that helped me a little bit to draw artistically, but not like drawing abstract stuff. I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say and you can make some notes if you wish. Do you understand? All right. Remember, you have one to two minutes for this. So don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? I'm going to tell you about uh, a professor who who lived right um, right beside me and um, right his house is right adjacent adjacent mine uh, he's a professor at the same university where I study and he teaches uh, at the College of uh, human ecology and um, I got to know him when when he because when we moved into this house, uh, the first time we were, uh, you know, we are a couple of students who move into our current dormitory where we stay. And uh, we are around nine persons right now. Before we were 10, but one person have already left. So we are nine at the moment. So, um, you know, during this uh, Islamic holidays, because Indonesia is densely populated, I mean, it's, it's a majority Muslim country. Uh, they have these uh, Islamic holidays, like, you know, uh, during the Ramadan, the Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitri. So the previous Islamic holiday was the time, that's the time when many people try to engage their neighbors, you know, give them gifts and greet them. So it's a very interesting day, uh, important day when it comes, when, when people often unite. Uh, so that day he approached us. He was the first person to come to us as students because, I mean, he was a professor. So he decided to invite us to his place to feast with him, to have some food. And, you know, because that day, almost everyone prepare a lot of dishes and invite other people to come over. Um, so, yeah, like I said, he's a professor at the university and that's how we met at the first time. And I think he's a pretty intelligent person because through how I don't I cannot say about his classroom intelligence, but overall through our interaction and how he approached us and we've been foreign nationals in his country. Thank you, Ahmed. I'm, I'm gonna just stop you there. Okay. You've spoken for two minutes. Okay. So um we're going to now move on to part three. And in this part, I'm going to ask oh, okay. some more general questions related to your topic. So let's consider first of all neighbors. Do you think it's important to have a good relationship with your neighbors? Definitely. I think it's 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 really, really vital. And the reason for that is uh, uh, my, my, my parents always tells me, you know, like um, your neighbors are your immediate family in the absence of your family. Because let's say, let's say, for instance, in the time of emergency, and when you cry out loud, you know, in your house, the first person, first responders are your neighbors. They are the first people who show concern. Not just that, whenever you are in problem or when you are in danger, so when you have something to share with other people around, I think your neighbors are the first people that comes around, you know. So I think having a good relationship with your neighbors is really, really important because uh, it helps you in so many ways. And, and you know, like the benefits is on both sides, yes. And why do you think some people don't get on with their neighbors? There's a friction in their relationship. I think uh, every relationship comes with own, you know, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, sometimes it's about finding common interest, I think. 
once people get along with their neighbors, it's like uh, maybe what the, the other neighbor is interested in, the other is not interested in. Let's say, for example, play music. Uh, this guy who lives right near, right close to my house, he's a professor. So most times he's really academically conscious. So if we are the kind of neighbors who are very well invested in, you know, uh, entertainment, playing loud music, shouting all of the time, he's not going to feel fine with that. So I think it's going to cause a little bit of friction between us. So I think that will be one obvious reason why people don't get along when they don't have shared interest. That could cause friction. And do you think that um, people's relationship with their neighbors has changed compared to the past? I wouldn't say completely, but I would say largely, yes. And I know a lot of people tell me not to say it, but I'll, I'll blame it largely on social media nowadays. Um, before there was in-person contact, you know, in-person communication, in-person conversation or people gathering together. But nowadays, uh, most especially in a country where I am right now, they have, they have you know, like WhatsApp groups for everything, uh, social media groups for almost everything. So you don't need to go to your neighbor to have a conversation with them. If you need a conversation of two or three, yeah, you quickly create a WhatsApp group. So that has reduced the in-person communication, the in-person contact. And I think it has indirectly impacted how people feel about, how people have, how people feel about their neighbors emotionally as well. So because the more you interact with someone personally creates that kind of emotion. So if you are not interacting with them emotionally, yeah, you act like, yes, you care about them, but you don't really have that emotional investment in, you know, in the relationship. So I think it's changed but, with advancement in technology. But don't you think that's a good thing? So, for example, um, in the past, we had to have a relationship with our neighbors, but now social media allows us to connect with people all over the world, maybe people with more things in common, so we don't have to rely on our neighbors. I wouldn't say it's an entirely good thing, uh, but it's okay. It's, it's, it's advantageous in a sense that if you don't get along with your neighbors, you still have people to hang out with uh, on social media, people all across the world. And of course, it is it's it's it is very, very good in the sense that uh, hanging out with people all around the world expose you to a whole range of you know personalities or cultures or how people do things. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's entirely good Having, having no connection with your neighbors and, in, you know, like basing all of your connection entirely with people across, uh, you know, people far away from you. Um, I don't think it's a good thing. I think everyone should find a way to connect with their neighbors, you know, like that unity in diversity. Uh, they should try to find that connection whatever way they can. And so what advice would you give to somebody on creating a good connection with their neighbors? Like I said previously, finding a shared interest is important. But if you cannot find a shared interest, um, I think it's uh, it's widely difficult to <laughs> connect with the person. But like I said, even in our differences, we can find commonalities. You know, um, one way or the other, you can strike a conversation. Um, you can try to monitor the person, see what they are interested in. If it is just for the sake of creating that relationship, pretend you like it, what they like, you know, create that shared interest. Maybe through conversation, deeper, deeper communication, you can find the shared interest. Maybe you don't know, probably you like what they like, but you didn't know until you pretended that you liked it. And then maybe through that <laughs> pretense, you can develop interest. So I think it's very important to have relationship with your neighbors in whatever way you can. Although privacy is important as well. So you cannot just bother someone if they don't want to be friends with you. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Yeah, that is so. the end of the speaking test. Great. Okay. So, yeah, wonderful. Thank I can you. I can really see why you got that band nine um, with the British Council doing your IELTS test. You're, <laughs> you're very fluent in English. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. So... Yeah, I I try, I try. I know it's uh, English is English is a bit uh, complex. Uh, it's simple. It's it's a it's a complex language in its simplicity because uh, sometimes it's just a matter of how you arrange your words and sometimes using the necessary words in the right context. So that's 
that's why sometimes it's, it's a bit difficult and communicating with people from different areas is also complex. I, I had some difficulties when I came here um, because I had to reduce it's my, my, you know, the speed at, at which I speak because I was speaking to people who were not native English speakers. So that alone impacted my whole speaking a lot. Yeah. And I had to speak to that level because <laughs> so communication is like, you know, understanding one another. So if I'm speaking at a faster pace and they're not getting what I'm saying, then there is no, there's no meaning to the communication or the conversation. So that impacted me a lot. And, <laughs> and yeah, it, that, that's think, interesting. Being in a foreign country, that. trying to adjust to the to that level. Because the people that I that do get the best oh. score are the ones that really enjoy and focus on communication rather than focusing on a test. So mm. you focus on communication. You're used to varying the speed of your voice, changing the words that you use in order to be understood and to understand the person you're speaking to. And uh, and the other side of, is people who uh, don't do so well in the IELTS test but are always trying to use the most advanced vocabulary and the most advanced grammar, but then their communication mm -hmm. suffers. So yeah. that's a very interesting point. Yeah, I, I think from, from my experience with the test was that simplicity is, is the key, I think, um, because uh, the lady was very friendly because I was interviewed by a lady. Um, she was very friendly. I know that is their nature, but that's how they were trained to behave. But um, I think simplicity is the key, answering the questions in most instances. So what I try to do, uh, like I learned from your course, is that whenever the question is asked, before you elaborate, try to answer the question, yes, no. Mm. This should be, I agree, I do not agree. Then you elaborate. So that's the kind of technique I try to use throughout the exam. So when they ask me the question, I will give my position. I agree. I do not agree. I partially agree. I disagree. Then I explain why. Or sometimes I tell them, okay, this has two ways. It has its own advantages and its drawbacks. So then I explain both sides. Even at one point, she asked me, I explain one side of the argument. I just give the advantages. Then her follow-up question was, so you explain about the advantages. So what were some of the disadvantages? Then I came to it because, you know, my head was like, <laughs> yeah. That's, a, that's great, yeah. And, and that helps you score very highly for fluency and coherence because you're able to organize your ideas in a clever way and use the correct discourse markers. Like there are two advantages and two disadvantages. First of all, blah, blah, blah. Second of all, blah, blah, blah. I, I think giving both sides of the argument tells the examiner that yes, you you can communicate fluently. You can you are not just one person who will stick to one side of an argument, just like a scripted answer you are given. You can defend both sides, although probably one side may be you may be more elaborative on one side rather than the other side. But uh, you know, um, I think. That's that's really, really important in the IELTS exam, I think. Yeah, in my opinion. And, and as so, I said, the templates you provided, they are they are really, really helpful. They are very, very helpful. But my suggestion or advice is that people should use the templates as like a, like a guide, you know. It shouldn't they shouldn't memorize the answers that are provided and go and provide them because the examiners are really smart. They are really, really smart. So when they hear a scripted answer, a lot of time, like during the exam, I paused, I answered, I give my, you know, I try to regain some, I try to put together some ideas and respond. So she knew I wasn't struggling for vocabulary. Instead, I was struggling to find ideas how to answer the questions. So, yeah. But your course was really, really phenomenal in in my in my success i think yeah oh well that's that's very nice to hear uh, hopefully it can be helpful to the general audience out there because i know a lot of people uh have some people are very good at the reading the writing but the speaking is is challenging and sometimes due to nerves some people are very quite good but when it comes to communicating with others they are very shy i'll say it's just be 
just pretend that the person who is interviewing you is your friend. Just, you know, obliterate that whole stuff, that person, that fear you have. Try to mask that person, like picture your friend face and that particular person. It will help you a lot. <laughs> so that's that's one thing I tried to do, although I wasn't too nervous. But I think that's one key advice I can give anyone. And practice is really good. Practice is very, very important. Mock test before the actual exam is very good. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful day.